Okay, we are officially recording. I want to welcome you all. This is the 2020 uh, SAN Annual Coordinator Meeting. I'm sorry we can't be in person, but we're bringing you um, a special meeting today. I'm very pleased um, that we have Russ uh, Poulin, who's going to be addressing us in just a second. And we have a special guest, uh, Aaron Lacey, who's going to speak to us at the end of our time together. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Russ to give our welcome welcome address. And while he's doing that, you can see on your screen that I have put up the agenda. I'm going to take that off so you can see Russ a little better. And I will put the agenda in the chat so that you can pull up the agenda yourself, the URL for the agenda. So Russ, are you with us? Cheryl, yes, I am. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. It's so good to have you with us today. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. And thank you for not taking a vote as to whether they want to see my face or not. But we'll uh, I didn't get it, let him do that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That was a good idea, I think. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the 10th SAN Coordinators Meeting. Wow, uh, 10 years. I tell you, when we started this uh, uh, 10 years ago, that we had the idea that, well, there'll be a few places will be interested in this, and we'll answer all the questions in two or three years, right? And then we'll, then we'll be done, and we won't have to do any more. But uh, that's not the way it went, was it? That there were... <laughs> Uh, all sorts of things that happen, and it's just great to have you all uh, here today. And, and it's uh, yeah, too bad we can't be here in, in person. So the first SAN coordinators, coordinators meeting was back in uh, 2011, which is the, how this get to be the the tenth. And I was looking back and seeing what well, what happened back then. That uh, that was the year that uh, Osama, Osama bin Laden was uh, killed. There's the giant tsunami that uh, hit Japan. Uh, on a happier note, Kate Middleton and Prince William got married. Uh, was the last uh, space shuttle, as Atlantis was the last space shuttle that was out there. Uh, there was the Occupy Wall Street, that hardly seems like that's 10 years ago, or, or it was the last Harry Potter film was that year. Um, Kim Kardashian was married uh, for 72 days, uh, uh, and Bridesmaids was a hit movie, and uh, uh, Cheryl Dowd was a 25-year-old recent law school grad 10 years ago, so there you go. Uh, with that, at the... Uh, first coordinators meeting that we had in, uh, in, in Boulder, if I remember right, we had it, that there was something, there's a phrase that we're using over and over again, and I hope that you can see this, and it might be backwards. We had, it depends t-shirts for everyone, because it seemed like at that time, there was no, no Sarah, no reciprocity, and lots of questions, and then it seemed like the answer to so many questions were, it depends upon what the state rules were, and what you were doing in that state, and and what your curriculum was and all these sorts of things. So that was the, um, the, wear, the stuff to wear now. And, and, you know, and who would have guessed that 10 years later that the, our apparel would be the, this is the SAN, uh, the official SAN uh, uh, face mask, which I hope that all of you have, uh, have with you. Uh, with that, for 10 years, congratulations to all of you. Uh, SAN works because it's a network. And it works because of all the members sharing and, and working together. Uh, you identify problems. You come up with, uh, uh, I've always called it sort of an early alert that, that we find out that, oh, something weird is going on in a state or some institution is doing something interesting. But it's a problem that others are going to uh, face as well and that we, that we, uh, we talk about it. And then uh, as you come up with solutions that you've been just great in, in uh, uh, sharing, the, sharing the solutions. Uh, uh, with all this, because that's the way it works, is you are the folks who are on the front lines and are doing this every day, so uh, we do better by sharing. Uh, so, it, you know, if we uh, could, if we we're together, I'd have you all give a pat on the back to each other, but uh, uh, there we go, we'll, we'll, we'll go, uh, we'll forego that. But uh, I also want to thank, uh, uh, you know, folks who have helped us, you know, we had uh, Marianne Boki originally was the, the first staff on this and contracting with us through NCHEMS. Uh, and then now we have uh, Cheryl and, and Dan. And let's give us a, a sitting ovation to Cheryl and Dan. And then, you know, put it in there that, that the stuff that they've done has just been, been great in getting this forward. So, so thanks, thanks, all of you. Yeah, there, there's the uh, seeing some of the uh, accolades coming up for the two of them. So thanks so much. Uh, so, congratulations to all of you. Uh, finally, uh, Cheryl asked me to look into my crystal ball. It's a very small crystal ball, but uh, I'm going to look into that and talk about some of the things that may be coming up uh, for the coming year. 
um, in terms of regulatory issues. And the, uh, uh, some of you may heard, there was an election at the presidential level. Some of you may have heard about that and that there's a new administration that is uh, uh, going to come in. Uh, the Biden administration, which is different from the Trump administration. You probably all have heard about those sorts of things, but uh, there, there's all sorts of rules that uh, were changed during the Trump administration that may get uh, revisited. And some of those include uh, lots of rules around uh, accreditation uh, and some of those that may get changed. I'm not quite sure exactly where they're gonna go. Some of the state authorization rules may get changed that there's some, we need some uh, clarity, especially around what they're going to do with the reciprocity uh, definition, because there's some, I think, some definitions, uh, some differences of agreement on that. I, I think we'll be okay, but it's just a matter of getting that that done and are being vocal about that. Uh, For-profit institutions is certainly going to be that was something that the uh, that the vice president, the, the uh, vice president elect, was very uh, keen on when she was in uh, when she was in uh, California. Uh, professional licensure, people ask, you said, well, with the new administration, will they do away with the uh, professional licensure requirements? Uh, no. Uh, if anything, they might uh, make them even, even tougher. So I would not, uh, for those of you who are banking that, it might go away. Uh, that's not going to happen, and you're still going to have to have to do them and should be moving forward. And remember, a regulation is a regulation until it's not a regulation anymore. So uh, some other ones that are coming up uh, about the distance education uh, uh, definition is one in regular and substantive uh, interaction. And we'll be working on getting some more guidance out about that because um, Van Davis and I and others have been thinking about you know, what to advise people on that. So uh, we're working on some things there. And also we may see that there were some distance ed, other student notifications regarding distance ed that were done away with. Done away with. We may see some of those uh, come back as well. Uh, and then, uh, finally, that uh, there was uh, probably less intense enforcement under the uh, current administration of some of these rules, and we may see that uh, that may change in terms of the uh, the new Department of Education. We haven't, uh, uh, I don't think, I haven't seen today that, that we have an announcement who will be the Secretary of Education, but that uh, we may see more enforcement of federal financial aid rules, and that's what where a lot of this falls. So with that, finally, just want to say um, we're going to have a busy uh, 2021. Wish all of you uh, uh, health and happiness and safety for the rest of the year and going into uh, 2021, which we hope is uh, a better better year and moving away from uh, the, pa the pandemic issues. And so with that, Cheryl, uh, that's all I have, and I'm going to turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Russ. Appreciate that. Um, it, it's always great to have Russ bring us to our roots of how we were developed. Um, you know, I came into the state authorization network as a staff person at an institution, and I, I really relied on Russ and the good work that he and Mary Ann uh, were doing and uh, those first few years that I was working at an institution. And then I just feel so blessed to be able to continue working with you all, and we keep growing, and I think that's fabulous as well. So. Uh, thank you, Russ, for being with us today, and thank you for um, making sure to remember to acknowledge Mary Ann because uh, it, it was very important for me to have Russ and Mary Ann with me. Yay, Mary Ann, thank you for waving, um, you know, to work together um, for several years, and I really appreciated that. I, I felt like I had big shoes to fill. Um, when I came over to San because I knew how good um, Mary Ann and, and Russ had been with everybody and so I wanted to make sure and carry that forward. So um, without further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, SAN 9 to let you know a little bit what's been going on in our network. So uh, this is the state of the network address is what I call it um, to be melodramatic about it. But uh, just to let you know, our membership is at 128 memberships. And as you remember, um, we have different categories of memberships. We have some a, just a couple of agency office. That's a, you know, like 1% of our memberships are agency offices. And then we have individual institutions that make up about, a, about two thirds of our membership. And then about 20% is small partnerships and about 10% is some large memberships of uh, consortia systems um, that make up more than 800 and 
10 institutions that are reported to us. And I know some of our larger memberships are still getting their arms around all of the institutions that are involved in their membership. So that's up from about 730 from last year. So we have a uh, nationwide um, a very large group of institutions, diverse institutions, still looking for a New Hampshire. No, we've got New Hampshire, it's Vermont. We don't have a Vermont institution. So my New England friends, help me get us a Vermont institution. So uh, that's where we are as of right now in terms of the size of our membership. So what did we do? So let's think back a little bit, you know, SAN 9, we run on an academic year. So SAN 9 was July 1 of 2019 to June 30 of 2020. So what did we accomplish in that time period? We put out a statement of work every year telling us what our goals are going to be. So um, we had an advanced topics workshop in St. Louis um, in October of 2019. We held a face-to-face -face SAN coordinator meeting in Denver. Um, we had a virtual seminar that was released in February of 2020, put out a white paper on student complaint options, a white paper on professional licensure disclosures implementation handbook with flowchart. Uh, we continued our very popular open forum the second Tuesday of every month. We formalized our podcast, our monthly podcast called Direct Disclosure, We're going to be recording one again tomorrow. Uh, we have our SAN advisory group has been instrumental to inform and advise the SAN staff. Our special interest team has been very active. Our professional licensure group put together two frontiers posts, a white paper of professional compacts, shared with us interviews with compact leaders, and gave us a list of examples of disclosures that were volunteered from members that's kept as a private document just for our members. And uh, we collated COVID-19 resources from institutional accreditors, national associations for state licensure boards, programmatic accreditors, and the US Department of Ed guidance. We um, provided a state institutional compliance quick chart, which was meant to be a little bit of a shortcut for our California friends uh, who are not participating in SARA or other institutions not participating in SARA who found that their uh, students were released across the country um, after the campuses were closed um, doing now remote learning. We provided several frontiers posts and uh, we um, unfortunately had to postpone our SAN workshop, our basics workshop, but we'll talk a little bit of that in a minute. And um, we strengthened our search feature on the SAN website. We hope you'll take good use of that. Uh, SAN 10 started in July. Um, we've completed a few of our goals. One was to provide the basics workshop that had to be postponed. We figured out a way to do it virtually, and I was really pleased with how that was able to work. We provided a professional licensure in a nutshell resource. It's available on the website. Um, we provided, an, a, we call it the newcomer experience exercise. It's a new onboarding tool for new coordinators who we uh, eventually hope to provide it to cohorts of membership contacts. It's a tour of our website. So you have better understanding of the access to resources that you have. There are so many resources there that people are a little bit amazed at how much they have access to. Uh, we provided articles on state authorization and professional licensure for SHEO, uh, did a webcast on professional licensure. You have access to that recording and provided an updated uh, white paper on the 10 steps uh, to begin the state authorization process. Cool stuff coming here. If you look on the SAN website, and uh, Dan will tell you a little bit more about it, we have updated Secretary of State registration information and an updated white paper to that. Uh, you can find on our website the um, presentations for the Sensational Awards for 2020. People are always asking, who's doing good work? We have great work that's being done by our institutions and you can, you can see those on the SAN website. Um, and we have some upcoming things. We are going to have a SAN coordinator meeting. These are events that Dan will tell more about, but we're gonna ask you to invite your provost or senior leaders to our January call. Uh, we're going to have a, a webcast with our NC SARA colleagues uh, to address tracking and data reporting. That is going to be on March 4th. Dan will tell you a little bit more on that, and it's also on the agenda. We're going to have an advanced topics workshop in March. Save the date, March 3, 4, 5. Um, it'll be virtual, and Dan will tell you more about that. And we'll continue collaboration with key stakeholders to get to the root of the research support that you need um, for professional licensure board requirements. We've been reaching out to programmatic accreditors and national associations of state boards to, to try to help them with the communication to share their information back out in the language that they speak. 
Um, we'll be collaborating with NASAPS moving forward. They're trying to figure out how they're going to do their spring event. We will have a virtual basics compliance workshop next summer. It'll be virtual, as I said, um, and we'll have more information on that as we um, continue to plan. Um, we have a new special interest team for institutional engagement. And, uh, you know, it'll be continuous direction to help you all utilize the SAN website for the resources and attention to um, routinely updated uh, the SAN website homepage. That's where you're going to find resources and events um, very quickly. That's where you find the timely notices, as well as in our WCET mix. So with that, I want to give um, Dan plenty of time to talk about our upcoming events and the strategic planning that we're working on. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Dan, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, as we all know, today is December 1st. Uh, we all know all about Groundhog Day. This is a, a, a day that's a little less famous, but 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 true nonetheless, on December 1st in Richmond, if a sparrow in my driveway sees its shadow, it means we have about another, another 75 minutes of sand meeting. So there you go. Let it be written, let it be done. Um, Cheryl did give a great summary of what we had been doing this last year and also gave a lot of information about upcoming events. Uh, I, don't have, I won't have a whole lot to add, frankly, but I will say that um, we are casting ahead a little bit to think about the future of what SAN will look like. As Russ mentioned, it has developed kind of organically, kind of haphazardly, kind of according to demand over these, over these first 10 years. And of course, it will continue to do that. Um, but at this point, we are also trying to be intentional about what the next three to five years will look like. Uh, the process for that has been, has been primarily driven by Van Davis, who you all know, a, a state authorization and, and fan WCET legend. Um, Van has contacted a lot of people within our organization, within the membership, outside of the organization, to try to drive uh, some, some dialogue on what we should be doing to get better. He's also talked a lot with the SAN advisory group uh, to try to come up with an identity statement, which is um, an elevator pitch on steroids to give Later, greater clarity on sales. Hi. Um, I just got a call. Cars ready. Um, oh, over there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me try to remember to mute yourself, please, if you are not speaking. Um, thank you. Um, so that is what's going on with, with the strategic plan. Um, and Cheryl, thank you for mentioning Hi. as well the unveiling. Oh my cars ready. Uh, Claudia, K-A-P-A. Um, Dan, if you could just hold on just a second. We're going to make sure that, that people are muted. Yeah, so that, I muted uh, that person. I don't okay, know. well, I think there's a, a several that may not realize oh, they're are. not okay. muted. I, I, I think that that's um, accidental, of course, um, but uh, I just wanted to help with that a little bit before you continue, because this is all very important information. So... Uh, thanks for taking the time there, Dan. Yeah, that's back all. to you. No, 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 no rush. Um, so Cheryl mentioned that we do have some Secretary of State resources that came out today. Um, this has been a topic that uh, has garnered a lot of discussion over the last years, I would say. And um, we've worked on an updated chart. We've updated the white paper, the talking points memo, I think is what we technically call them. But I will say this about the chart. It is not a black and white chart. It is not a, in every state, we, we do have information on all, on all 50 states plus the district and Puerto Rico, but it is not a yes, no. And that's because it can't be a yes, no. Russ's old towel or t-shirt, I think that was, is, is apt. It, it does depend. It depends on what activities your institution is doing. Um, it depends on what type of institution you have, whether it's public, private, for-profit, not-for-profit, what, the, the, um, the nature of your contacts in that state, even if we're just talking about online education. So there is no yes, no answer about whether you as an institution providing online education in another state need to register with our Secretary of State. However, what this does do is it jumpstarts your, your research process. It tells you the contact information for the state, some relevant regulation or legislative or um, 
or laws, laws or regs, the, the primary source citations are there. You can read those. You can get a little bit of analysis and another column has, has questions and other resources in a given state. So what this really does is if you never, if you don't know where to start, you can start with this. And what it does is it educates you for when you go see your general counsel, you say, hey, I'm wondering about this. I think this is the regulation. I think this is the statute. I think this might apply. How, what's, how can you help me from here? Being, being educated when you see your university counsel, as you all know, makes a big difference. But the other thing about this chart that's worth mentioning, for, for regardless of the content, is that it is the collaboration of about 15 of you. 15 of you volunteered uh, back in the, in the summer to help, help with this. And so, you know, SAN as a network only, only succeeds when there's collaboration from its members, as I've said, a lot of times. And so I think that, um, that uh, so, so it's not that that makes it wisdom, just that you've heard me say it a lot. Um, but I think that that is something to be excited about. And I thank each of you who participated. The other thing that we updated for Secretary of State, we did update the talking points memo uh, from, from almost two years ago. Uh, so that should be useful as well. That's not as much of, that's more of a process document. So that's, hey, I don't know where to start with researching Secretary of State. This gives you some steps to start the research process and to move it forward on your campus. Um, so then Carol mentioned a lot of um, events. Um, so I'll just go through a couple of these. There's the open forums coming up. The last one um, in De uh, the December 8th one is the last one in our special series on sensational awards. So we'll be hearing from University of Kentucky on their two wonderful projects. Then in January, you'll get to hear from the SAN advisory group. Um, talk a little bit more about more what it's like to be a member of the group and uh, to try to drum up some interest. We're going to have an opening coming up here in 2021. Um, then, of course, we have the special jumbo edition uh, or the special bring the provost January 26 coordinator call. Um, we're going to have some experts from outside of our usual group to to talk about some big picture ideas. And it would be wonderful for you to bring um, your provost or someone equally important. Um, and then we have a wonderful collaboration with uh, NC Sarah on tracking students for planning compliance and data reporting on February 4th. And then keep, a, keep, keep your eyes on March, March 3rd, 4th, and 5th is a state author, is a, um, I'm sorry, an advanced topics workshop. So we are excited about all these things. Uh, if you have any questions or um, input on any of this, um, please, do, please do let us know. I will now turn it over to Cheryl for the next. Well, Dan, you know what? I'm going to need you to um, elaborate a little bit more on the upcoming things that we have because I am uh, working on getting people into their table talk areas. So perhaps you could share um, a little bit more detail on what we plan for the advanced topics workshop. Um, okay. And I will talk slowly, I, I, I suppose. Um, the Advanced Topics Workshop is really um, about skill building rather than content. So that's a that's a fine line that we that Cheryl and I and Russ and others debate all the time about what what should our workshops be about? Should they be about content or should they be about skills? And obviously, they're always going to be a little bit about both. Um, but our feeling is that um, content is is relatively easy to find um, on our other resources and um, the other problem with focusing too much on content is that even in an advanced topics workshop, there is a huge um, range of understanding of these topics amongst our members. Um, some of you are true experts and some of you are, are, are much earlier on your journey of understanding. Um, and so when, we're, when we focus too much on content, it's hard to, as anyone who's ever taught anything knows, you know, you don't want to make it so it's too uh, overwhelming for the newcomers or too boring for the um, advanced people. And then you end up with some kind of middle ground that sort of satisfies some people. Um, so we're, we're, um, we're thinking with, with some of these skills that we're working on, 
those will be able to help you regardless of how much you know about these topics. So some of the skills we're thinking about is really drilling down on getting your provost to respond to your emails. We could, we could do some real email email advocacy practice or learning how to write a comment. Uh, we've had a number of times when the feds or states have asked for comments on some of these issues and we know that they do respond, we know that they do read them. Uh, so how can you write um, a compelling a compelling comment? So those are just a couple of the, of the skills, uh, of the skills that we're brainstorming. And, we're, and um, we're hoping that that will make for a um, useful, useful exercise for, for everybody who come. Dan, did you see Heidi's uh, question? Uh, I have about, not. Let me pull about, up my chat here. Okay. Just wondering when you might have an agenda so that they can uh, let their provost. Oh, oh okay. Um, we, well, oh, this is for the, um, this is Cheryl. You know what, yeah. Dan, if you could refer them to the agenda, um, they'll see who the two people are that we're going to have. Um, if you could um, uh, maybe share that with them, their titles. And, oh, oh uh, right. Oh, this is, I'm, I'm getting, this is for January, for the, for the January. Yes, coordinator for the call. January yes. coordinator call, please. Okay. So the, the, the heavy headers here are um, Karen Solomon, who's the vice president for accreditation and relations director at Standard Pathway um, HLC. And Bob Shireman, Director of Higher Education Excellence and Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation. Um, so these are two very knowledgeable and, and, and um, well-spoken, um, not well-spoken, uh, um, experts in the field. <laughs> a little fresh, a little fresh information too. So um, really thinking that those, those were good gets for us. Um, so we're, we're excited to share that with the membership. Cheryl, how are we doing on um, organization? Or Russ, do you have anything to add? Stretching two more minutes. Okay. I can, I can add about, uh, yeah, Karen uh, Solomon that we've been uh, talking with her from Higher Learning Commission. So that's the, uh, you know, one of the uh, formerly regional uh, accrediting, accrediting agencies, but she's been very helpful for us in terms of the um, but we've been calling the issue of uh, the end of forgiveness that there, <laughs> there's been all these waivers and things on, on several different things. And then uh, Higher Learning Commission was one, one of the first to say, uh, even though the Department of Education is going to let you have uh, waivers on some of the distance ed rules, that they're, that was up to the accrediting agencies whether they wanted to uh, take those waivers or not. And, and Higher Learning Commission will not. So after December uh, after this month now, um, they won't be doing that. And so she'll, there's going to be more and more expectation that as you're doing your remote and online courses that you follow the, uh, be following the, the rules, you know, that for a distance ed course, a fully, a fully online or distance ed course. And I think she can help with that. And then Bob Shireman is, uh, um, used to be in the Department of Education, um, uh, is working uh, now with Century Foundation, very much on the consumer protection side, uh, very worried about uh, uh, are things that we're doing uh, with with distance education, uh, uh, frankly, with reciprocity, frank and, and with uh, uh, other sorts of sorts of things that we're doing with technologies. Do we know enough so that we're protecting students? And so it'll be interesting to see from. Uh, something from that perspective about you know what what they would like to see in terms of more protections the the issues that he's run into and and the sort of protections that uh, uh, he might predict that uh, uh, those in the new administration might give so it's it's a couple uh, yeah as Dan said some uh, you know heavy hitters they'll give us uh, um, that that probably a lot of the folks in the provost level probably have, have at least heard or appreciate who they uh, what their position is. Yeah, Russ, and it looks like Heidi has a follow-up here on uh, if we have a written snippet on discussion topics. Um, Heidi, which, um, which do, I'm not sure what you're asking. I guess a little bit, it sounds like she's asking a little bit more about what, what exactly will we ask them to address? in, in oh, the session. Okay. And so, so that would be something that we could probably get together and send out that, that would be helpful so that they have, 
I can see where she's asking for something to, uh, they can say, here are the people and here's what they're going to talk about that so she can hand it or email it to somebody. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you for, for filling in for me there, Dan. I appreciate that. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I was waiting for us to get to top of the hour. Um, what we have done for this next portion is to provide you with an opportunity to, um, if we had been in a room together, we'd been sitting at tables, round tables of eight to 10 people. I can start my video again, sorry. Um, of eight to 10 people. And we would have said, this is gonna be the topic for your table. We'd like you to address it and to, um, to uh, you know, put your thoughts together. And we would have had a report out. We would have gone on around the room. Well, obviously we're, we're a little challenged in that regard. So we thought we would adapt. And so what we've done is we've put you all, we've assigned you to different Zoom rooms about certain topics. And we've given each of you a table leader and uh, this table leader has uh, a Google Doc that uh, she or he will share with you. And we'll go back room to room to make sure you have uh, the Google Doc uh, link because you can contribute to it. So for example, Russ is going to lead a table a Zoom room on state authorization 101. He's the table leader. He has a document. Um, there are some starter questions on those topics. Um, you can choose to use the starter topic or not. Um, if you would like to go ahead and um, you know, have your own discussion of, of topic areas. Sometimes people need a kickstart and we wanted to offer that. Um, so you can share on the Google Doc so everybody has access to it. And then um, those Google Docs will be made available for us to be able to, instead of having a, a verbal report out, we can report out through the use of reviewing the Google Docs. So don't be concerned. If you're at a table that is discussing something, then you would like to know also what was discussed at another table because you're going to have access to that. So um, the idea here is to uh, interact with each other about what you're doing at your institutions, what's worked, what hasn't worked. It's a safe space. Let people know what works and doesn't work. And uh, then you can um, then you can share that information together. We'll report it out. And uh, the reporting out will be via Google Docs. You'll have about 20 minutes in the room. Um, I'm, you've been, like I said, assigned to these rooms, and I will release you to those rooms in uh, just a minute. Um, and uh, when you go, I'm bringing up my information so that I know. Um, so you're going to go to those rooms. You'll be there for about 20 minutes. Um, you'll get a last minute uh, notice that you're going to be moving back to the main room. We'll sit here, Dan and I will, in this main room and make sure people got to in a room. And then we will... Um, then we will uh, make sure that everybody has the access to their Google Docs. So um, I hope you all enjoy this. I think it's always wonderful to meet other people from across the country that are doing the same work that we all do um, and get a new fresh eyes on some of the work that we do. So enjoy this exercise and we look forward to having you back uh, in about 20 minutes or so. So you all will be sent uh, participated in our advanced topics workshop uh, a year ago and uh, contributed to our virtual seminar last February and uh, has, you know, interacted with us uh, time and again. We really appreciate that he could take the time to be with us today to talk uh, again, you know, looking to the future. Russ talked a little bit about those distance education regulations um, and a little bit about, you know, the uh, something that was a little closer to the things that we do, but I think we're gonna look at a more broad picture um, from Aaron and I'm really looking forward to that. He has a couple slides he'll share with us, which we will make available. Um, those will be on the SAN website um, for the coordinator call information along with this agenda and the recording for later use. Um, so I'm gonna turn it right over to, to Aaron. So Aaron, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. It's Absolutely my pleasure. I'm always uh, delighted to get to work with you all and uh, re remember seeing everyone in St. Louis and I'm still here in St. Louis. I don't know where everyone else went, but I haven't gone anywhere. I just want to, so maybe you guys can come back at some point in the future. Let me, um, let me get the slides up here and uh, make sure we have all that going. Can you see that Cheryl? Is that coming across? All right. Looks great. All right, I, I went for the alliteration here unabashedly. Like Post-secondary politics and prognostications. I had policies in there at one point. I thought it's too much. It's too much. So um, yeah, Cheryl's right. So I wanted to take just a little bit of a step back 
I mean, we're going to connect to what you all do specifically in these ideas of state authorization and reciprocity, et cetera, and the rulemakings. Um, but I thought I would take a step back here and just spend a little bit of time talking about where the state of the Beltway is and um, some of the stuff that's going on and how that will ultimately or could ultimately impact uh, what you all do in a very real way. And sometimes I think it's easy to think of the machinations in the Beltway as being so far away and not really impactful with regard to what we do on a daily basis. But you all know, I mean, that's just not the case, particularly when you work in a regulated environment and what you do is tied so closely to those regulations that are being considered and promulgated. Um, but, you know, it's, it starts with the statutes, right? So you've got the U.S. Department of Education over there and they're promulgating regulations and they're supposed to be executing on the statutes um, that are first and foremost created by Congress. And uh, there are some really interesting things happening right now as a result of the elections and still some considerable unknowns. Uh, and I thought it would be good to recap a little of that specifically as it impacts higher education and as you all are looking forward to the next couple of three months and, and, and even years. Um, so not what we expected in the House uh, at all. And we'll start on the House and then we'll go to the Senate just real quickly. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are aware that pollsters were predicting uh, about 75 percent chance of the Democrats gaining seats in the House. And that is not what happened um, to the surprise of many, certainly those pollsters. Um, the uh, Democrats will hold a majority, continue to, but the party actually lost seats, the Democratic Party in the House. Um, and they're down. It looks like they're going to be around 222. There's still three or four races that are um, out there percolating. But uh, it's important to note that a minimum majority in the House, a minimum majority is 218 seats. So while 222 is still a majority, it's a very slim majority. And what that means is if you don't have all the Democrats in line, if there are, for example, um, some moderate Democrats who don't want to go along with a piece of legislation or some sort of initiative, uh, they can hold things up or prevent things from moving forward entirely. Um, so what that means is uh, even within the Democratic Party, there's going to have to be a lot of cooperation if they want to exercise that majority without even getting to the fact that you've got the Republicans there across the aisle. Um, education committee leadership, importantly, and we're going to talk about this on the Senate side here in a minute, but I think that's unlikely to change. So as you all probably know, within the House and within the Senate, you've got all these different committees. And uh, in both the House and the Senate, respectively, you've got a committee that is responsible for things higher education, all things higher education. On the House side, it is currently named the Committee on Education and Labor. The chairman of that committee currently is a Democrat, uh, uh, Representative Bobby Scott. And, and this is an important point, the party that is in control gets to decide ultimately uh, and typically the majority uh, within each committee structure, right? So if the Democrats hold the House, that means each committee is going to have a majority of Democrats, even if that's just by one. And importantly, the chair of the committee is going to be a Democrat, right? And on the other side, you'll have the ranking member. And, and being in control of those committees means you get uh, uh, to dictate the direction of policy of a lot of control over the legislation that can make it through and out of those committees and onto the floor and ultimately potentially over to the president's desk to be signed into law. So um, having control of whether it's the House or the Senate is really important because it impacts the uh, committee structure. And for you all, that includes, of course, the structure of these education committees. Because the Democrats held the House before the election and because the Democrats are going to continue to hold the House after the election, albeit by a smaller margin, they will still control those committees and the chairs of all those committees, including the education committee, will be a Democrat. Bobby Scott, I mentioned, has been the chair of the Education Labor Committee in the House um, and has expressed his interest, uh, sent a letter very recently, November 10th, uh, to the Democrats saying, I'd like to remain in place. So in the House, you have a slimmer majority now, but the Democrats continue to be the majority right. And importantly, your critical committee leadership there at the Education and Labor Committee is going to stay the same. Also, that means when you get into these more nuanced issues like state authorization and reciprocity and the definitions of, of you know, uh, distance education, things like that, it is more likely if you've got someone in a leadership position who's been there in recent years that they're going to appreciate and have familiarity with those nuanced issues. And I do describe those as nuanced. I deeply appreciate that for the people uh, participating in this Zoom call, concepts like state authorization are not nuanced concepts. You deal with that every day. It's a huge part of what you do. 
But when you take a step back and you talk about sort of the universe of educational policy issues and laws that are floating around on the Hill, um, for a congressperson, uh, a senator, even for a policy advisor who spends a lot of time in education, these types of issues really do constitute nuanced issues, right? Because you're getting pretty specifically into the weeds on certain things. Um, so having some continuity in that leadership in the House is not a bad thing because you'll have someone hopefully who's got some familiarity with those more nuanced issues. Now, let's talk about the Senate side where we really have a lot um, yet to learn about what the uh, 117th Congress is gonna look like. So also not what was expected. Pollsters again, with about a 75% chance predicted that the Democrats would take the Senate. Uh, and that did not happen. Uh, instead, right now, the Senate remains up for grabs. As you all, I'm sure, know, there are two uh, seats in particular that are going to be subject to a runoff, both in the state of Georgia. Um, Purdue is facing off against Ossoff. Don't know if I said that correctly. And Warnock is challenging uh, Kelly Loeffler. So the Republicans are favored slightly at this stage, uh, but there's no doubt it's going to be tight. I don't think anybody would want to stake their career on calling the outcome. Um, Historically, Georgia tends to lean Republicans, though, and notably, voters have not sent a Democrat to the Senate out of Georgia in about 20 years. But let's talk about the different outcomes and how they can impact higher ed policy and you guys specifically. So if the GOP wins at least one race, right, then the Republicans would continue to hold the Senate. That means, I was just talking about this earlier, the committee structures stay the same, meaning that the majority of individuals on each committee will still be Republican and the chair of each committee will still be Republican. Um, it would be unclear in this scenario who the chair and the precise members of the help committee would be, even if it continues, the, the Senate it continues to be controlled by the Republicans. And that is in part because Lamar Alexander, who has been the chair of your Senate help committee for uh, the last several years, um, is retiring along with Enzi and Pat Roberts. So you've got three pretty prominent centers, including the chair of the help committee, all who are retiring. And it's, and it's totally unclear if the Republicans maintain control who the successor chairperson would be, whether that might be Rand Paul, who is in line, or Richard Burr, Susan Collins, or Bill Cassidy. Um, you know, the, and, and this is a really important point that I wanted to hit on here. Lamar Alexander, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you know, was was almost unquestionably the kind of senator you would like in the chair seat um, insofar as you're talking about an individual who knew a lot about higher education, former governor, former secretary of education, former president of a state flagship university. I mean, this was an individual who was dedicated to the cause. You might disagree with his policies, but certainly had an appreciation for higher ed. It was meaningful to him. And, uh, and openly and repeatedly indicated throughout his career that higher ed policy was a priority. And so we saw in recent years that that was the case. One of the, I think, unfortunate realities for higher education is that there is really no successor to Lamar Alexander um, or even potential successor that seems to have that kind of familiarity with higher education or that sort of interest and dedication to, uh, I'll call it the industry for lack of a better phrase. Um, and, and, and so when you talk about nuanced issues, as I was discussing this before, like distance education, state authorization, reciprocity agreements, what that means is you are less and less likely, it would seem on a go forward basis, at least for the next few years, to have someone chairing the help committee who has that type of knowledge of that nuance and appreciation for its importance that a Lamar Alexander had. Um, so at least in the Senate, and, and I'll say on the House side to some extent, but certainly in the Senate, even if the Republicans maintain control, you've lost a, a chairperson who really had, uh, was quite dedicated to the higher education space and to po advancing policy in that space. All right, what happens if, if things go differently, if the Democrats win both races in Georgia? And this is extremely interesting, and I've seen a lot of misinformation out there, or at least confusing information about this scenario. So I wanted to make sure to touch on this with you all. Um, so if the Democrats win both races, right, in Georgia, both those Senate seats, that would deadlock the Senate at 50-50. And most of you have probably heard in the news, and this is accurate, well, that means the vice president would have the, the swing vote, right, um, to break any type of deadlock, which would um, give the Democrats a, a, I'll call it a technical or a literal, however you want to think of it, but a majority, right? So in a, in a straight forward vote, um, if you throw in 
uh, Vice President Harris, uh, the Democrats would have 51 votes. But I've also heard a lot of folks and a lot of news outlets um, sort of casually suggest that this also means that when you have a realignment of committees and committee chairpersons, um, that it would just all flow as if it would if the Democrats had 55 seats in the Senate. And, and that's not the case. And this is a really important nuance when you talk about higher education policy, for example. So the, the Senate, after you have an election like this and there's a realignment of, in the Senate of seats, there's typically what's called an organizing resolution. And that's the thing that says, well, the Senate passes it and it says, this is how our committees are going to be set up. And this is who are the chairpersons are going to be and the members of each committee are going to be. Um, and it creates the new majority ratios. So if the Democrats were to, if they had 55 seats, clearly you would have a majority on each committee of Democrats, right? Um, and your new chair on each committee would be a Democrat. But here, if you have a deadlock of 50-50, right, which has only happened one other time since we had 100 states, um, and that was in 2001 following the Bush-Gore election. Um, in this case, McConnell and Schumer would have to reach a compromise on the makeup of these new committees. So the Democrats likely would still, um, I mean, they would be deemed in the majority, right? Um, but there would be a, a sharing of power. It would not be the type of distribution of power that you see when either the Republicans or the Democrats clearly hold the Senate. So just by way of example, in 2001, the one other time this happened, uh, Senators Lott and Daschle, who were, who were the majority minority, uh, or I guess in this case, you really didn't have a majority minority, but the two respected Democrat and Republican uh, uh, leads, um, compromised on evenly divided committee rosters. So you had 50% uh, of each committee belonged to each party and certain special privileges for legislation. Essentially, what that boiled down to was typically the party in control controls the floor and what gets to the floor. And in this case, there was an arrangement where even though um, you had, and at that point in time, the Democrats deemed a minority, they still had the ability to get legislation to the floor. So what all this means, circling back for you all and for the higher education community, is that even if the Democrats win both seats in Georgia, right, you're not going to have a scenario where the Democrats own the Senate in the way that they would if they had 55 seats, right? You're still going to have a sharing of power. Well, why is that relevant? Because it means that even if the Dems win both seats in Georgia, you really don't have the House, the Senate, and the White House all completely controlled by the Democrats. And what that means is if you have some sort of uh, wish list higher education legislation that comes in from the Democrats, it's likely not going to be successful, right? Because the Republicans are going to have enough power by virtue of having 50 seats in the Senate to be able to stop that potentially in its tracks or at least for significant compromise around it. And, and if you're the Democrats, you know that. So it probably would not be worthwhile putting up that type of wish list legislation. Um, all of this is to say uh, there's really no scenario at this point going forward where something would just sweep through uh, the House, the Senate and over get over to the White House unopposed. That's just not not going to happen. And and so and there's also going to be a lot left to see about how those committee structures are designed if the Democrats win both those Georgia seats and how that sharing of power works out and and specifically for the help committee who ends up on that help committee. And if you have folks who have any significant higher education experience, or if you end up with folks who are more on the healthcare side or the labor side, for example, um, in which case reauthorization itself may be difficult. I was talking with a colleague of mine this morning who's a lobbyist in DC and he said, you know, Aaron, right now with Lamar Alexander having retired without knowing who's gonna be on this committee and given the folks potentially who we believe could fill these shoes, reauthorization of the Higher Education Act actually feels a lot further away than it has felt at any time over the last two or three years. Um, so you may not see any successful reauthorization of higher ed over the next two or three or four years, depending on how this shakes out. And, and you may not see any new statutes or legislation really getting at the issues around, for example, distance ed um, and reciprocity and state authorization. So that means New law would come likely from uh, the executive branch and specifically the Department of Ed in the form potentially of regulations, 
for sub-regulatory guidance. Um, just as a reminder, uh, this is sort of where we are right now with regard to the rules that were created by the outgoing administration, right? So we had the big accreditation innovation rulemaking and they broke it up into three parts. Um, one part of that became effective this July and that included state authorization of distance ed programs. And that's your top box here on the screen in front of you. Um, and two parts of that will become effective this coming July, July 1st, 2021. And of course, if you look at the bottom box, as you all know, that includes the new rules for distance and competency-based education, including things around uh, regular and substantive interaction, which I know you all have been talking about and thinking about a great deal. So what do we think this department's regulatory agenda might look like? And Cheryl and I were talking about this a little bit um, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, so first of all, wh what will be the priority? To what extent will they be revisiting um, items that were on the prior slide that came out of that accreditation and innovation uh, rulemaking agenda. You know, I, 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 candidly, I don't think this will be something that they are trying to accomplish in the first 12 months or the first 24 months of this administration. I don't think there's much that they will accomplish in the first 12 or 24 months um, uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Now, I think they will announce their agenda. I think they'll start making progress towards it, but I'm going to get here in a minute to the soonest date you would expect to see any new effective regulations. Um, but I think the other thing that's really worth mentioning, you all know this accreditation and innovation rulemaking uh, resulted in consensus, right? Now, and, and Cheryl and I were joking about this yesterday, consensus doesn't mean everybody was happy or agreed with the final product. At least that doesn't mean it was everyone's perfect uh, idea of what those regulations should have looked like. What it means is they all agreed to compromise so that they could get get to consensus. And so certainly there have been people, I suspect there were people on the day the rulemaking ended who immediately began to voice concern uh, or displeasure with the way certain of those items were resolved despite having agreed to it and, and gotten a consensus. That having been said, consensus still has power. I mean, they did get to consensus. Everyone around that table did agree on all points so that that could be achieved. Um, and I think the incoming administration's going to know that um, and uh, want to provide some level of deference. That doesn't mean they won't initiate change around some of these new definitions. They won't rethink some of the ideas that were considered before. Um, but I think they'll be very careful about it. I don't think that they will be gung-ho in um, revisiting and overhauling um, ideas that a large group of people sat around the table and, and agreed to, pursuant to the process that the department is supposed to follow um, under statute. The other thing, and I'll, I'll hit this again here in the last bullet, but keep in mind too, you know, I don't think this administration uh, disagrees with uh, uh, or will disagree with um, a number, at least conceptually, of the ideas that came out of the accreditation innovation rulemaking. I mean, disclosures are generally good. I think these folks will embrace the notion that disclosures are positive, being, you know, additional information around licensure programs and certification programs, things like that are positive. I don't know that they're going to say, you know what, we think uh, residency makes a lot more sense than location. I think things like that will stick around. So to the extent that there are changes, my expectation is um, that some of them may be uh, fairly nuanced. Um, but you know what, I also yield to, to Russ and Cheryl and others who are much deeper in the weeds certainly than I am when it comes to some of these issues uh, and have no doubt that they know better than I do what might, might already be on the table or percolating in the minds of some of the folks coming in to Washington, D.C. The other thing though, and this gets to timing that I think is worth highlighting is um, accreditation and innovation as broad as it was, was nowhere close to the only rulemaking that came out of the outgoing administration. And it certainly will not be the only rulemaking or set of topics that might be revisited or considered by the incoming administration. To the contrary, I think that there are probably several that are of great concern to them. Um, the first being Title IX. Uh, and by the way, they do not have to go through negotiated rulemaking to revise the Title IX rules that were promulgated by this prior administration. I expect they will attack those right away. I think they are very concerned about some of these other things you may have heard about, the bar defense rule, gainful employment, which I use as a proxy for some sort of debt to income a metric that they can use to hold institutions accountable for the quality of their programming. And I think this administration, like the outgoing administration, uh, has real interest in the federal composite score that's calculated 
for schools each year based on their financials. So all of this is to say, I anticipate a robust regulatory agenda from this administration. Um, and while I think that revisions to the concepts that you all are concerned with on a day to day basis will be part of that mix, I think it is important to note that there are uh, a number of other things that they're going to be very seriously considering as well. And some of them may certainly take priority. Now, let's say theoretically this administration came in and they said, you know what, we saw that video with Aaron Lacey on it and he does not know what he was talking about. State authorization is our number one priority. So we're going to start to work right away on a negotiated rulemaking. They do have to go through NEGREG anytime you have a rule that has um, been promulgated under Title IV of the Higher Education Act, it's subject to negotiated rulemaking. And so that means even if this administration came in and distance ed, state authorization, reciprocity, we're off the top of their list, right? They would have to initiate first a negotiated rulemaking, which would probably occur in the summer or fall of 2021. They would announce that they're going to go do it. And then they would launch it and carry out that rulemaking in early 2022. If they are successful in getting through it, they would put out a proposed rule, usually in early summer. You would expect um, comment period to end and a final rule if they're really on their game to hit by November 1st, 2022, which means the earliest that a new rule could become effective on any topic, including state authorization, reciprocity, et cetera, would be July 1st, 2023. So almost three full years from right now, which leads me to my last bullet. And then I've probably exceeded my 20 minutes. I apologize, Cheryl. I can barely say my name in 20 minutes. So I, uh, I, I, I'm doing my best. Um, practical advice, practical advice. Uh, first of all, I would invest in compliance with the current rules. I'm not suggesting they won't be revisited. I'm not suggesting um, that there won't come a point where you'll have to go back to the drawing board and make new disclosures or do additional research. Um, but for the reasons just articulated, it seems highly unlikely that you are going to see any significant change in this regulatory framework for at least three years. Um, I think at best you'll have a proposed rule uh, in a couple of years uh, on this topic. I mean, that would be the fastest that you might get a first glimpse of where changes might be coming. Um, and then like I say, November 1, 2022 is, the, is probably when you would see a final rule or late October, November on, on a topic in this area. And that's if the department deems it uh, a priority such that they want to get through it on the fastest poss possible timetable. If not, if it takes second seat to some of these other topics, it could be 2024 before a new rule comes along that you might have to comply with. The other really important thing to note is, again, conceptually, the ideas that are foundational here um, to, to the current regulatory framework, right? Accountability, um, disclosures, making sure students have information that they need, making sure that that information is being disseminated to a, a wide and appropriate audience. Those types of ideas have bipartisan support, right? I, I mean, the Democrats and Republicans disagree regularly on, on the nuance. They disagree on sometimes how they want to achieve some of these, these ideas. But I don't think there's much disagreement that, you know, conceptually they're giving away billions of dollars in loans and institutions of higher ed should, in their view, be accountable. I think both parties feel that way. So investing in a, a framework and infrastructure at your institution that allows you to track students and the whereabouts, to make direct disclosures when they need to be made, um, to update websites timely with new information, uh, to disseminate uh, general disclosures during orientation and time periods like that. I think all of that's going to be worthwhile. Right. Because I don't think that, you know, while the nature of the disclosures may change, you know, while the exact student groups that have to get them may change, those fundamental concepts, I don't think are going anywhere. So even with all the uncertainty, one of the things I always tell my clients and folks is particularly in times of transition like this, you know, there's a lot that we don't know, but there are some things that we do know and, and things like that these concepts are going to stick around and that both sides are interested in getting good information out to students. And if you focus on the things that you do know, even during a period of transition, um, it can sort of help guide you in, in your strategic planning and making sure that you're investing your time in the right places. All right. So that's it for me. Uh, and I will, let's see, Cheryl, let me figure out how to stop sharing my screen here. Um. I'm sure I can do it. Okay. Well, even still, Aaron, this was fabulous. Um, thank <laughs> you so much. Um, you know, and, and, and your continued, you know, 
chatting about all of this is really important. So a time frame is not an issue. We only have a couple minutes left, um, and that's all I really needed to be able to thank everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Russ Poulin, for being our, our welcome address. Y you all had two of my favorite speakers today. Having Russ speak at the beginning and having Aaron speak at the end, you know, was just fabulous. Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us of course, today. Of course. Um, so looking forward, uh, please remember there will be no December 4th, Tuesday of the month SAN coordinator call because that will fall on the holiday week. Um, and so we had this meeting today. You can find all the information from this meeting on the SAN website under coordinator calls. I'll have it all up uh, by the end of the week. Um, at latest. And so um, you'll find there um, the recording, the uh, Google Docs from the um, table talks that went on. Um, please look forward to our events. Uh, if, first of all, there is an event on Thursday. It's a webcast that WCET is hosting. You can get to um, the registration page from the home page of the SAN website. So you might want to register for that. It's uh, Russ Poulin, um, Van uh, Davis, and um, uh, Fred Loken uh, and me uh, to talk about the uh, playbook, the digital uh, learning regulatory uh, playbook that we put together um, and distributed. Um, uh, when would you do it? October um, about a, a number of higher ed issues affected by COVID. And uh, we, of course, have open forum next Tuesday. Can't wait to hear University of Kentucky talked about their uh, two sensational awards. So a special one hour open forum next Tuesday. And then, of course, uh, in January, we'll have open forum with our SAN advisory group. And uh, we will get some more information about the January coordinator call um, to give you a little bit more of the background of the uh, special guests that we'll have for that coordinator call um, about more specifically what they will address. Um, I think both of them have a wealth of things to share. So being able to pin that down may be, may be hard at this point, but we will. And uh, of course, please look for the registration for the uh, NC Sarah and SAN webcast that will be February 4th on tracking students, planning, compliance, and data reporting. And so we look forward to that. So it's time to go. Thank you so much for your time today. It was great to see you all. I appreciate you going through uh, this process with us for a very special um, SAN coordinator call since we couldn't be together um, for an in-person call. So you guys are terrific. Thanks again to Russ and to Aaron and to Dan uh, for helping to coordinate this. So have a great day, everybody. And we'll be talking soon. Best to everybody.